We had the best time doing the initial breakdown of the body language and behavior in this video, and we decided we'd revisit some of our favorite moments from it. I gave an interview the other day in which you said you've been briefed on unidentified flying objects. Are they, are they real? Uh, well, I don't want to really get into it too much, but personally, I tend to doubt it. Uh, I mean, you have people that swear by it, right? And pilots have come in and they said, and these are pilots that are not pilots that are into that particular world. But we have had people saying that they've seen things. Uh, I'm not a believer, but, you know, I guess anything's possible. We spoke to... All right, Greg, what do you got? Let's start by talking about presidents in general. They, they have a, a product they're selling. They have a brand and his brand is chairman. That's his brand and always will be. Each of these guys, I'll tell you what I call their brand. He stays to his brand. He does the typical Trump thing as he's illustrating and he's regulating. He puts his hands together, pushes you out and then comes back. One interesting thing to note, pay attention to this emotional eye accessing cue. When people look down into their right, those are emotional eye accessing cues. As you think about your children, think about happy moments or sad moments, you'll find your eyes drifting down to your right. This president does this. At the minute he says, I talk to you, watch Trump back up and brace for what's coming. And I think he's navigating here. If you watch his eye movement and him choosing and editing words to make sure he doesn't say anything bad about servicemen and women that he values. That's all I think we see here. Um, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I think the the video starts out with what, Greg, that you really helped all the panelists identify something called the surrender steeple, when the steeple has, has gone down a little bit. And that's pretty normal for him. And when he says, personally, I tend to doubt it, he has an invisible question mark there. And he does not hardly ever use this up talk where his, the tone of his voice goes up at the end. And one other thing I think is unusual here for this video is that when Trump wants you to believe something, he socializes the situation. He'll say other people are believing this, and then he'll build up the credibility of those other people, which we see here. I mean, you have people that swear by it, right? And pilots have come in. We have had people saying that they've seen things. And that's been the way that he operates since day negative 5,000 of his campaign. So he's been doing this a long time. I also think Tucker could have asked probably a more open-ended question here and might have got a little bit more data from there. Scott? All right. I think another thing we see in common here uh, with all, and that we're going to see in common with all these videos that, that's go, that are this one of the threads that goes throughout these things is that, that these guys, when it comes to the presidents, and well, pretty much everybody, they've been told not to tell what they know. You know, they, if there is anything there. So they've all got their stock. They all cover the same stuff. They all cover how we don't know what it is. We don't know uh, where it came from. They talk about movements, those types of things. And then they go on to uh, talk about how it could be, it's possible it could be something from another planet or something like that. So we really don't see, um, nailed. nobody says, nope, that's not it, or yep, that's it. Nobody gives a yes or a no, really. We just see that. And we know that, that, that Trump's being pretty honest about this, about giving the information he can give because his tone goes low. His, vo his voice goes low and his tone goes low. He gets quiet. And then he starts delivering his answer. He gives strong eye contact there at the top. But he looks away for a minute to check his story. I believe that we'll find out as we go through here. These people have been given, um, here are the facts you can give. These, these two or three facts, that's it. But just add your thing to it. So they take that information and they put their, like, like Greg was saying, they put their information and they, they form their version of the story around those facts. I think in this case, Trump is, is, is telling all he can tell us at this point. Mark, what do you got? Have you ever Googled someone and then been shocked to see the personal information exposed on one of those public listing sites? I just Googled one of our upcoming subjects and I'm amazed by the private information that is on the net about them, even their home address. Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. That's why we're suggesting you take a look at our sponsor today, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove the information you ask them to, but they make it really hard to do. Let Aura handle it for you. You can try Aura for two weeks using our link. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you don't see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls 
antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and even more. You get everything at one affordable price. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can go to Aura.com forward slash TBP to start your two-week free trial. Also linked below in the description. Yeah, so there's some classic baseline Trump there, the point, the wipe, symmetrical, lots of stuff that we'd really expect from him. Uh, what we wouldn't normally expect is some of those vocal clicks that you get. Now, quite often I tell you a vocal click is meaning some stress. I think the stress here is about him not being able to take charge of this story. And if he were able to take charge of this story, then it would be, yeah, we've seen the biggest fleet of spaceships. We've had the largest amount of spaceships coming in. and But really, he's not... He's not taking charge of this in that kind of way. So we kind of get this story of he doesn't really have anything to, to give us. Normally he'd be exuberant, he'd be full of energy, full of hyperbole about it, and there's nothing of that usual nature. So that, to Scott's point, either means, you know, he's been told, you know, don't, don't, don't take this story anywhere, or, he has nowhere to take it. There is just nothing there. I don't know which one it is at this point, but we're not seeing, we're seeing some of the usual ch Trump and some of the unusual Trump as well. There, that's what I got for you on that one. One of those tape replays. I gave an interview the other day in which you said you've been briefed on unidentified flying objects. Are they, are they real? Uh, well, I don't want to really get into it too much, but personally, I tend to doubt it. Uh, I mean, you have people that swear by it, right? And pilots have come in and they said, and these are pilots that are not pilots that are into that particular world. But we have had people saying that they've seen things. Uh, I'm not a believer, but, you know, I guess anything's possible. We spoke to But what, what is true, uh, and I'm, I'm actually being serious here, is, is that uh, there are, uh, there's footage and records of, objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. We can't explain uh, how they moved, their trajectory. Uh, they, they did not have um, an easily explainable pattern. And so, you know, I, th I think that we're, uh, people still take seriously trying to investigate and figure out what that is. Uh, but I have nothing to report to you today. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, Chase, what do you got? I think it's interesting that in a lot of these presidents and government officials, when asked this question in particular, you see the same lateral boundary hand movement. And we're seeing that in, in people who it's pretty, a pretty uncharacteristic behavior for. And I thought that was pretty interesting. We saw the same thing here in Obama. And I think there's honest behavior for the duration. Uh, it's keeping within all of his baseline movements. And I think at the end, we're seeing his contemplation about the other information. Not that there's any deception going on, but I think you can see those lips tighten up. You know, he pulls his lips tight right at the end of the video. And I think he's withholding information. That's the definition of what lip compression suggests, denotes, or indicates, as Scott would say, I think that came from Joe Navarro. Mm -hmm. But that's literally withholding information. Uh, Greg? Yeah, so when I watch him here, there are two, two or three things that stand off. Again, downright, downright, downright. Every one of these elected officials I'm seeing downright. Now, is that emotion there because, hey, I want to tell you something I can't? Is it because, hey, there's something more than is here? Do I feel obligated to? Don't know. But I'm seeing that downright I accessing in two presidents so far. Let's keep a watch and see what we see. He uses a push-pull word. And I'm, I'm actually being serious here. Anytime somebody says actually being serious, actually. Now, I know he's just been joking, so that's part of it. But I want to ask, well, were you serious here or were you serious there? For you, if a person says actually, you should pay attention to that word because that's not a usual word a person has in their vocabulary. To use it all the time, it means nothing. Um, he's navigating what to say and in classic 
classic Obama style. That's what he does when he's not on prompter, is he negotiates through as he's talking. And he, his strategy is what I call the entertainer. He's the guy who's going to keep you entertained. He's going to engage you. He's not going to flirt like Bill Clinton, but he's going to engage you. And he's doing the entertainer. He does that lip grip. Same thing we saw. A little bit of muscle engagement here. He goes to barrier and adapt a little bit. And then there's a pronoun shift. You know, I, th I think that we're, uh, people still take seriously trying to investigate and figure out what that is. Interesting. So something's going on his head. Doesn't mean anything magical. Just means we can see something going on. We don't know what. So let's dig in. Scott, what do you got? All right, of course, we want to know what he knows and if he knows anything. And I think he knows whatever there is, I think he knows it because we're seeing him be honest and he's being honest with his answer. And we're seeing him again, just like in Trump, we're seeing him thinking about a second and then delivering. He's using the classic Obama illustrators here. He's using that upside down fist with that thumb out a little bit and do and and illustrating this way with specific parts there toward the end. And as he's doing this, he's being again the classic Obama. It sounds like I'm thinking as I'm going forward, but he is going back over. He's got those three or four facts that he can give and he's arranging them and, and delivering them as he goes along. I'm sure he had the question before this and it was going to come up. And he has, in general, what he's going to say. And the reason we know that is that he doesn't know exactly what he's going to say is because those illustrators land a little bit late, uh, later than the words land as he's speaking. So the word will hit, then the illustrator. The word will hit, then the illustrator. They're not on point like that. They're on point like that. That's a little too much, but a little less than that. An easily explainable Pattern. But that's how we know that he's thinking and, and and structuring things as he goes along and rethinking as it happens. Happens very quickly. You do it, too. Um, so I think what he's doing, I think he's being honest here. And he's telling us all he can tell us. And I think out of all of them that we're going to see, this is the guy I would believe the most as we go through this, because he looks so so honest in, in, in his delivery. All the bells and whistles for me, there are there are no bells and whistles. It just says, hey, this is all truthful here. And that's all he can tell us, I think, at this point. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yep, so symmetrical, again, like Trump, that's that's usual for him. So that's, that's good. He's on form there. The thing I want to pay attention to is the downward inflection that he has. It's a little more depressed. It's what I would call a little bit disappointed. They did not have um, an easily explainable pattern but I have nothing to report to you today. I think again, like Trump, he's disappointed that he can't really take control of this message. Wouldn't it be great for both of them if they could go, hey, you know, I'm gonna tell you all that I've got right now. Or they could go, hey, I'm, I'm gonna tell you there is, don't worry, there is nothing out there. Or, or, you know, they could, as a president or a past president, take charge of this situation wouldn't this be a moment of history? Well, not for either of those two, because because they don't get to do that. They because either they've been told, you know, just hold the information back, or there's simply nothing to deliver. And both could be massively disappointing for them. Not only on a on a level of, hey, I'm president, I wish I could give across this information, but maybe there's even even some personal disappointment there of going, hey, I wish there was some like proper aliens about, but. It appears there isn't, or I just can't tell you. I don't know what it is, but certainly there's a little bit of disappointment there from him. That, that's what I got for you. One of those tape replays. But what what is true, uh, and I'm, I'm actually being serious here, is, is that uh, there are, uh, there's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. We can't explain uh, how they moved, their trajectory. Uh, they, they did not have um, an easily explainable pattern. And so, you know, I, th I think that we're, uh, people still take seriously trying to investigate and figure out what that is. Uh, but I have nothing to report to you today. It's okay. Um, did you um, see just one type or different types? There were nine total. Uh, I only got to essentially work, back engineer, or analyze one of the craft, but there was a separate hangar for each of the crafts, and uh, each one was essentially different uh, in its visual appearance. Did anybody tell you where the U.S. Navy intelligence got the craft from? No. 
No, not at all. That's uh, you know, a lot of people have speculated about it that they were either shot down or they crashed, uh, but uh, the craft seemed undamaged, so I doubt either of those would be correct. All right, Chase, what do you got? So we see something here that I think is, I'll give you the truthful part first. Back in this video, he's doing this, I haven't calculated the number of years. A couple 30. decades prior, 20 years some odd prior to his appearance on Joe Rogan. Same story, different words. That speaks to truth. Same story, same words is more likely to be a rehearsed story. The deceptive part that I see in this interview, if someone looks away, not just with their eyes, but with their skull, so we see eyes and skull looking together, as they're looking away, they're retrieving some data or experiencing some kind of feeling, that's when they'll start talking. In this video, we see a eye and head break away, and then he looks back to deliver the information. So I think this is the deliberate recall of something that he has memorized that it is not truthful. Excellent. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so you're starting now to see, number one, yes, Chase, while I agree with you, he is saying the same words, he's using different facts. This is in direct contradiction to what he says to Rogan. There was damage in one of these aircraft. Well, he hasn't been there since before this, so there's a fact issue right here. You can't have you can't have multiple facts in one story. That part I, I have a problem with number one, just on the on its face. But watch him. I believe, and I think this is 2009. Wait until we're going to go back to 1989 as well, which is his first time, and you're going to see him building his story. That thing that the Susan Lucci role he's playing now that he's played for 30 years that he knows that role inside out is building. And every time he's probed and poked he's coming up with more details so that by the time he gets to Joe Rogan, he is much more believable, which is why if you watch Joe Rogan and you thought, hey, this guy's the real deal, I, I, I don't doubt it. When you first look at it with face value without understanding his eyes are moving to the same spot constantly, that he has developed this story over 30 years and he's playing Erica over and over and over, you don't get the this piece of it. So when you go in to look at him, Pay attention to he's moving around. It's not just his head. He's jitterbugging as he's trying to come up with answers for this guy. And there's almost a little amusement going on in his face as he does it. And as we go further back, you're going to find even more of that as he's filling in these details that will become those permanent words that, that we're talking about, Chase. I think he's a master storyteller. He missed his calling or maybe he didn't. He is a master storyteller. I wish I believed him because like you said, I really want to believe this. I want to believe we've got some, some little guys who are telling us how to do the world better sitting in a, a cave somewhere. I just don't think so. Yeah, that's great. Um, the, the thing about the moving around the chair and he's nodding every time he starts talking about the, the nine ships and all that, he's giving that confirmation of, yeah, and he's dead eyeing this guy. And he's also wiggling around his chair as he's doing it. So it shows he's a little bit nervous about it, but at the same time trying to make sure he sells it well. You know, that's all I've got. You guys have covered everything. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so one of the things you might want to do if, you, if you're looking for somebody uh, and, and that they may be nervous around deceit is put them in a chair that moves easily because you will find they'll start swinging on that thing, they'll tip it around, they'll do all kinds of stuff. If you've given them furniture where they can lock themselves in really hard, they'll be looking more calm and assertive. In this one, we don't get the super calm and assertive modern Bob Lazar. We've got a mid-period Bob Lazar here, uh, you know, the artist known as, and, and he's doing a great job, but we, we've, got, we've got some of those vocal ticks. It gives him time to come up with his story. He's still making a sound. It, it clears... The, the throat there because it's getting a bit dry. He's under stress and, and pressure. So, um, and, and look out for that rhythm as well. Think about uh, Scott's idea there of the, of the loping. You know, it's got a rhythm. It's got a, 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 a smooth gallop to it. It suddenly gets very sticky in areas around this. There were nine total. Uh, I only got to essentially work back engineer or analyze one of the craft. Now we do see it in, in some of the stuff with, with Joe Rogan. It does hit, he does hit that again. What he does is he starts to say that he's got a migraine. 
when he gets off his sto story, he starts to say, I've got a migraine. And he's already prepared this because he's told everybody in the studio and his partner there that there's a migraine going on. It's very like... Uri Geller used to do. Uri Geller, if it was going wrong for him, would say, I don't feel strong tonight. I don't feel strong. <laughs> and, so, and, and migraines, though we, we do know a lot about why they ex exist and how you get them, it's one of those things you can't touch. You can't go, come on, man, it's just a migraine. Like, come on, pull yourself together. It's just a migraine. The moment somebody says, I've got a migraine, we all, you know, back off and go, okay, okay, well, all the better the for us then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, if you're in the village. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get yeah. Over it. Greg, don't, don't interrogate me now. I've got a migraine. Can you, you know, take it easy on me? Yeah, of course, of course, you'd still go for it. But anyway, I just wanted to bring that up in that he's, he's using the mid-period. Uh, he's doing pretty well, certainly a lot better than we, we see in the early period where we will start to see the mouth really moving about all over the place. Um, uh, but um, check in with the, some of that Joe Rogan stuff to see where he starts to invoke the idea of I'm not in good physical or mental shape right now. And that's why you might feel so there's some inconsistency in my ideas. That's my take on it. Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah, and I know that uh, that Chase and Greg will agree with, with me on this because uh, in interrogation training, when you talk about when someone said Mark hit it right, hit right on the on the nail on the head, the dream situation for someone, their sitting situation is a chair that swivels with wheels on it. I mean, that's 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 uh, that just that'd be wonderful. It was like if we made that the law because that just, you learn so much from that. You know, and a lot of times if I'm doing if I get to do a lot of. Uh, financial things and so in those rooms they've got those those really nice chairs and you sit there and talk to them, they're wiggling all over the place and that leg gets to go and oh it's it's uh, it's beautiful so it's yeah beautiful. mark yeah you nailed that one of those tape replays did you um see just one type or different types there were nine total uh i only got to essentially work back engineer or analyze one of the craft but there was a separate hangar for each of the crafts and uh, each one was essentially different uh, in its visual appearance. Did anybody tell you where the US Navy intelligence got the craft from? No. No, not at all. That's uh, no, A lot of people have speculated about it that they were either shot down or they crashed uh, but uh, the craft seem undamaged, so I doubt either of those would be correct. So next month, a government report is expected to be made public on the sightings of UFOs. As the former director of national intelligence, I think there, there have been a lot of theories about UFOs. What do you make of these revelations? What might this be? Have you seen any yourself? What do you make of this? Well, uh, first, I think it is kind of uh, there, there is logic to the intelligence community addressing this since the intelligence community has a lot of practice of dealing with ambiguity and less mm -hmm. than complete facts. And secondly, I think it's, it's really important that the whenever we uh, witness such phenomenon that uh, it is recorded and documented uh, for the future. Uh, and when we may have, gather more information and have a better understanding of uh, what's what is it, what's transpiring, uh, could there be life out there? Sure, uh, as, as huge as the universe is, we you know we, you really can't reject that possibility. So I think this is a good thing. Uh, the transparency, uh, I ex expect this report will be filled with ambiguity as well. And people, uh, depending on their leanings, will extract what they want out of this report. All righty. I'll go first on this one. Um, he said similar things about a thousand different subjects and said almost the same thing. In a lot of He has a structure to, to his answers. And that's what he's done here because he doesn't answer the question. At the, if you'll listen throughout, he doesn't answer the question. He gives the same information everybody else has been given. That, that, was, that block of information and just wording it in his in his fashion there's something up here there's an issue here because after he says the intelligence community has a lot of practice in dealing with ambiguity and less than complete facts we see a crimping of that right part of his of his mouth goes up and most of the time that denotes it indicates smugness 
or contempt or disdain, something or, or dislike. So there's something in there he doesn't like about that. Maybe having to answer the question again, maybe with the answer he's giving or being that he has to give instead of just saying, look, there's nothing there. Or like Mark said, yeah, there could be, they're, they're, they're here, something like that. So something in there is bothering him about that. Um, and overall, he's not answering the question. It's a lot of just that boring ramble. And we've seen him do this a lot when he's been, uh, in his in in hearings he's done before, and so he's really good at that. Really good at that. Greg, what do you got? I love my people. <laughs> this is a guy with many many years leading SIGINT signals intelligence. Then he moved to DIA for many years. Then he was a satellite, a, a private satellite company guy. Then he was an intelligence guy. This is not an elected official. This is a guy who's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm going to answer the question you allow me to answer. And Chase, sound familiar? Give me the wrong question, I'll give you the wrong answer. That's the way this works. So he's walking down the path. He's giving you the answer to whatever you're going to allow him to answer. He does look down into his right, but it's not an emotional accessing cue. He's looking at something because you see him look at it twice. He's got some note there probably like I have right here, and he looks down. But there's no real emotional anchor like these other guys you're seeing, these elected officials. This is a guy who spent his entire life in the intelligence business, had a short stint in the Marines, and then after that he's been in the intelligence business. He does do a couple of interesting things. When he says, secondly, get a brow furrow about what the report's going to include. And then he says, this will be, and he does one shoulder shrug. He doesn't have any idea what's going to be in the report either. He's been out of the office too long. He doesn't know what they're going to put because of the stuff that's just come up. And then he says, I don't think there's going to be any insight. And this thing's going to say, as usual, is what he's actually saying to you. This, he doesn't show any emotion because this is a seasoned intelligence professional. People who spend their careers in intelligence have a different mindset because they don't feel obliged to tell you anything. While an elected official feels like they're letting you down, we all know working behind the screens that if we tell you the wrong thing, we're going to do a lot more damage than telling you nothing. So we don't comment on rumors for a reason. That's it. That's all I got. Um, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and Greg, he's uh, he's your people. He started off in Army Intelligence. And a lot of people don't know that uh, there's a whole, there's many, many intelligence agencies in this country, a whole lot more than you can count. And he was also, you know, he was the, he was the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence. It's the highest, highest place in the land. The power of this position is like the director of the CIA reports to him. And, you know, we've got a, there's top secret is not the highest security clearance. Like I think the highest you could probably go is called Yankee white. And that's like the nuclear launch codes. That's what that security clearance is called. So this guy has access to pretty much everything, but he was also a uh, chairman or in charge of the director of the national geospatial intelligence agency. It actually does exist. And that probably would be the agency to ask, you know, if, if we were dealing with anything like that. And the video that we're seeing here, I, I've seen a lot of people on, on other comments on this thing where it's switching between white and black. The camera that's being used is infrared. It's called a FLIR, a forward-looking infrared camera. The thing that you hold on to is called, we call it in the military a potato because it's kind of shaped like a potato. And we're switching between either white is hot or black is hot. So that's what's uh, going on in that video there. I think it's interesting that he wants to know if there's life out there. He looks kind of interested in that. He gets the most animated when he starts speaking about that. And I enjoyed his candor about the reports being jammed full of ambiguity. <laughs> and I'll just I'll just leave it at that, uh, Mark. Yeah, I think uh, Chase. I think Yankee White is actually a color by the uh, Farrow and Ball Paint Company. Should you want to be redecorating your home, uh, Yankee <laughs> White would be a, a beautiful addition to it. Would to I have to say? Walls. Would I have to pronounce it Kalur? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> <think> exactly, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, now I think now now we've dealt with um, with 
the art and craft of, of Chase's new home. I think what's interesting here is we get an eyebrow raise, I think, at the start of, of some openness. I think he's quite open to to having a go at some of this. And it may be, as Chase, as you say, some openness to the idea. But then we're just, we're, we're just deep in bureaucracy here. And from my point of view, yeah, we've got somebody very high in the intelligence uh, services and agencies here. But in my experience, that means you just got a better level of bureaucrat right in front of you. And so, and so what all we've got is like less than complete facts. It's like, I'm going to really take, take apart these facts and, and look for ones that are less th th than complete. The idea of, of uh, transparency creating high levels of ambiguity. It's like, oh, great. Like the more information I give you, uh, the less you'll understand around this. So we're deep in a, in a Kafkaesque bureaucracy here, whereby the more you get, the less you will ever know uh, about this. Yeah, I think I think we're getting shoulder shrugs on the possibilities here. So so maybe he doesn't know where this report uh, is going to go. What what I dislike most about this is there's a, some very clear images that go up there, and the interviewer doesn't say. So what's that? Like, tell me about that. All that happens is, is that is that phenomenon is already categorized in the area of UFO. And then questions are asked about unidentified flying objects. Then rather than going, what, where, what would you class that phenomenon that I see in front of me right now? That's the kind of question that I'd be asking, but who knows the kind of answer that you'd get out of a top level bureaucrat like this. They might wind you up in so much, you know, triple sign paperwork that you never get anything, uh, anything out of them. Yeah, that's oh, what he, I got on that one. He would go to default answer number one. It's either aliens or it's not. <laughs> it's not. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. It's possibly that or possibly not. One of those tape replays. So next month, a government report is expected to be made public on the sightings of UFOs. As the former director of national intelligence, I think there there have been a lot of theories about UFOs. What do you make of these revelations? What might this be? Have you seen any yourself? What do you make of this? Well, uh, first, I think it is kind of, uh, there, there is logic to the intelligence community addressing this since the intelligence community has a lot of practice of dealing with ambiguity and less mm -hmm. than complete facts. And secondly, I think it's, it's really important that the whenever we uh, witness such phenomenon that uh, it is recorded and documented uh, for the future. Uh, and when we may have, gather more information and have a better understanding of uh, what's, what is it, what's transpiring. Uh, could there be life out there? Sure. Uh, as, as huge as the universe is, we, you know, we, you really can't reject that possibility. So I think this is a good thing. Uh, the transparency, uh, it, it, I ex expect this report will be filled with ambiguity as well. And people, uh, depending on their leanings, will extract what they want out of this report. In 1947, an object crashed in the New Mexico desert near the town of Roswell. The Air Force recovered material described as metallic and rubbery, though the government changed its story as to what it was, calling it a flying disc at first, then a weather or spy balloon. It just read ridiculous to me that the US Air Force had changed its story. Yeah, and they added additional elements over time and, and um, tried to conflate additional programs to explain some of the events. Why are these things crashing? Yeah, you know, some, some are landed, some are crashed, and I think that's an interesting discussion that's come up, you know, I, as advanced as, you know, we are, you know, as humans, right? You know, planes crash, cars crash. Just because you're some uh, advanced sentience that has advanced technology doesn't mean um, some small percentage of your, I'll use the Air Force term, like sorties, um, you know, meet uh, an unfortunate operational conclusion, as, as we might want to say. Most people would tell you the Roswell incident has been thoroughly debunked. In fact, the Air Force published this report in 1994 to put the issue to rest once and for all. Grush has read it. That analysis they did was um, 
a total hack job. And even um, anybody with analytical skills, if you read it, you can you can deduce that they're conflating multiple um, situations with crash test dummies and, and, and mogul balloons. And they're just saying that the townsfolk who personally witnessed it were totally um, imagining things. They concocted that whole report uh, just to disinform. So the All right, Chase, what do you got? There is one thing and pretty much one thing only here that really shook me the moment I saw it. The most of this clip behavior that is suggestive here is just based on his baseline in this context of what I think is probably truth telling, mostly kind of fluid, weird cadence, which is his baseline tone, pitch, volume, pretty semi normal. Still has the normal weird spikes in his tone that might point to acting or being on stage. And it all goes well until the end the precise moment and it's at the final like quarter second of this clip when he says the word disinform they concocted that whole report uh, just to disinform he displays the most powerful lip compression here with a really strong chin boss movement this is this muscle right here we associate this muscle which is like a little triangle muscle in the chin it's called the mentalis with grief or quite often shame and this is well-researched by people like Dr. Paul Ekman. I've developed a lot of our modern understanding. And even Paul Ekman based a ton of his work on this Swedish anatomist guy named Carl Hermann Jortsho. So we're seeing some kind of grief or shame here, absolutely. But the tricky part is that we can't see the whole body. Distinguishing between grief and shame is difficult. But I think there is some kind of grief. Shame, you're a little bit more likely slightly more likely to see the chin drop when shame happens uh, as opposed to the grief. Uh, that's all I got for this one here. But there's something around that, that word, disinform. Mark? Yeah, interesting you mentioned that. We don't confer before this. We don't uh, We don't compare notes. Uh, we just get into this. I, my note here is now he's letting us know what to look out for in a disinformation story. He tells us that... Um, uh, you should look out for conflation, concoction, and imagination. Conflation, you know, um, melding one thing with another. Concoction, just the the creation of of something out of forms that are already there, mixed together, and then imagination, something out of out of nowhere. Um, you know, and and if you have the analytic skill, you can deduce that it's a um the, the when disinformation is going on he says he says look you, you know with the analytic skill you'd be able to see if this were disinformation and tells us exactly what to look out for there's one other thing that comes across here which is just because you are intelligent does not mean that some percentage reach an unfortunate operational conclusion and i think that is apropos for him just because just because you are and I've seen it time and time again, just because you're super smart and you're an analyst and you have clearance and it doesn't mean that you're not going to crash the craft, <laughs> doesn't mean that you're not going to reach a conclusion that is not factual or reasonable or what the real conclusion should be. So let's never think that just because this guy you know, may have awards, may have been given clearances, may well uh, have got scholarships. And, you know, I've met a lot of intelligent people uh, who can't be allowed to cross the road. Um, so, so, you know, watch out, watch out for that. Just because he's smart doesn't mean he can't make horrific mistakes. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, the expression of fear after, yeah, and there's one before some are landed yeah you know some some are landed and the fear he's showing is when he goes like that is his, his lips come out like that it's a small it's a it's a version of fear so we're not seeing the 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 frozen part of it we're seeing these little micro expressions of fear at the oddest times and i agree with you chase we're, we're seeing some some really interesting fear anger grief it there's a there's a whole lot going on here and i think it's because he may be saying one thing but he's been told to say to, not to say this because he doesn't feel uh, the thing he's saying. He feels something else. So maybe that's that's part of it. And then you've got the part where he maybe he does know a whole lot about something where somebody got killed or something. But then again, like Greg always says, maybe he's using that as the example so he can refer back to that. But 
couch it as aliens or whatever it is that crashed or the, wherever, wherever the pilots are from that that type of thing but then when he talks about the the crash he's he's got he's got this lilting in his voice and then he reroutes away from that why are these things crashing some are landed some are crashed and i think that's an interesting discussion that's come up he's great at staying away from the answers from answering the questions he's he's being asked and let's i know i bring these kind of things up it comes from when i was in the music business and fr from engineering tons of, of of records and and producing tons of records i i can hear things that pop out at me and this this is what i thought was fascinating i thought this is where you were going chase but when he says um that when he's talking about the crash and he said the analysis analysis they did was a total hack job the analysis they did was a, a total hack job so what happened was they they cut when he said what the analysis they did and then he says it was a, a total hack job. There's space between there. Something else happened because, and enough time, and enough space to make the emotions change in there. You can hear the edit. Analysis they did was a, a total hack job. You did a good job. I'm not complaining about whoever edited that if you're watching. You did a fantastic job of it. However, you can still hear that edit there. You did cover it with the video so we couldn't see his mouth or see the change in the video. But if you had crossfade those a little bit tighter, you, it wouldn't have been there. But listen to how the voice sounds normal, then it goes to an entirely different emotion. It's quieter. The voice is really strong up here. The volume is good. The cadence is cutting right along at a pretty good speed. And then the tone changes, and it gets lower. And his, the, his delivery is a little softer, and his cadence slows down. So in that one sentence there, we're hearing them edit it. What it means, I don't know. It may not mean anything. It may just have been editing for time, but I don't, I don't, I don't think they should have done that or they had a problem, a glitch somewhere in the video or something, but there's that to put in there. So that makes me a little bit suspicious. I, I don't think they're the that News Nation is in with this guy. I'm just saying the editing there was a little, a little, a little iffy. Great job, but it's still, you can tell something's up there. Um, Chase, what do you got? Me. Or is it Greg? I knew it was one yeah, of you guys. Yeah. yeah. So his yes increase a lot here. Yeah. Yeah. And his tone has changed. If you hear the way he's talking, his tone has increased dramatically. I'm going to add one more thing. Chase, we saw the same thing. This compression with the chin boss. I don't think it is grief. I think it is containment. Look at his upper face. Look how his upper face looks amused when he's talking, but his lower face doesn't match. Everybody's sitting there. Start smiling and try to control it and watch what happens. You're going to bring up your chin boss while your chin boss is not something you automatically control when you're trying to think of ways to control things watch what happens and he says it as a key at a key point at disinformation that is an important data point in my opinion from everything we've seen to now one of those tape replays in 1947 an object crashed in the new mexico desert near the town of roswell the air force recovered material described as metallic and rubbery though the government changed its story as to what it was, calling it a flying disc at first, then a weather or spy balloon. It just read ridiculous to me that the US Air Force had changed its story. Yeah, and they added additional elements over time and, and um, tried to conflate additional programs to explain some of the events. Why are these things crashing? Yeah, you know, some... Some are landed, some are crashed. And I think that's an interesting discussion that's come up, you know, as advanced as, you know, we are, you know, as humans, right? You know, planes crash, cars crash. Just because you're some uh, advanced sentience that has advanced technology doesn't mean um, some small percentage of your, I'll use the Air Force term like sorties, um, you know, meet uh, an unfortunate operational conclusion as, as we might want to say. Most people would tell you the Roswell incident has been thoroughly debunked. In fact, the Air Force published this report in 1994 to put the issue to rest once and for all. Grush has read it. That analysis they did was a, a total hack job. And even um, anybody with analytical skills, if you read it, you can, you can deduce that they're conflating multiple um, situations with crash test dummies and, and, and mogul balloons. And they're just saying that the townsfolk who personally witnessed it were totally um, imagining things. They concocted that whole report uh, just to disinform. What do you got?
げよう。